Hello, I'm Margaret Graf Garrisey. I'm the medical director at the Institute for Reproductive Medicine and Science. Um, and I'm very lucky and privileged because I've been working in the field of infertility for more than two decades. And the in vitro fertilization world and uh, practice of medicine is actually relatively new. Uh, in vitro fertilization, or test tube babies as some people call it, has been around just a little over 45 years and there's tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of children uh, conceived and, and living happily from this technology and even those children born from IVF or in vitro fertilization are now having their own children. In vitro fertilization, as everyone in the world knows, was actually invented years ago by our pioneers, uh, Dr. Steptoe and Mr. Edwards, uh, many years ago to treat tubal infertility. In infertility, 40% uh, of infertility is usually a sperm problem, 30% is ovulation problems in the female, 20% is blocked tubes or uterine problems, and 10% is unexplained. Uh, before in vitro fertilization was invented, um, women with blocked tubes who couldn't get pregnant with intercourse were just out of luck and adoption was their only option. They were focusing on the woman's blocked tube, but that woman with the blocked tube had perfect 28-day cycles. So for about 200 couples over two years, they tried to get that one egg out of that one follicle that's naturally ovulated every month. And sometimes they would get an egg and sometimes not, or it wouldn't be mature, or it wouldn't fertilize. So in those very early years, as they were going back to the drawing board, trying to make IVF work for people, most of the people in their early experiments didn't even get an embryo put back into the uterus. Finally, they lucked into Louise Brown. It was a miracle. You could take pictures of the family and put it in Time or Life magazine, but the percentage chance that it was going to work, if you said the first pregnancy after 200 couples, was so low that it couldn't be clinically applied. So one of the very first breakthroughs in vitro fertilization to be able to offer it to many people and have a clinical pregnancy rates that you could, could explain to the public and to the patients was getting more follicles and more eggs to work with. Much of what we do in infertility is a numbers game. Uh, and so infertility doctors had infertility patients with the 40% sperm problems, the 30% ovulation problems, the 20% tubal problems. So we saw all of these patients. So finally, the IVF doctors that were trying to fix the problem for tubal infertility said, well, you know, there's these young women out there taking these fertility medications. In the olden days, the, the most prevalent one was Pergonol, which was a urinary gonadotropin. There are women out there that don't ovulate, and they're taking drugs to get them to ovulate, which the girls with the 28-day cycles are getting for free, that, but they've got blocked tubes. And their side effect from their medication to help them ovulate was multiple births, twins, triplets, etc. So the tubal infertility docs looked at the side effect, the undesired side effect of multiple gestation and said, well, what if we load the dice up front? We really only want that woman who doesn't ovulate to ovulate one egg to get one baby, but her side effect is multiples. Why don't we take that girl's side effect from her medicines, give the medicine to the girl with the blocked tubes who ovulates like a star every 28 days? And that made the pregnancy rate in IVF overnight go from almost zero to 15%. But 40% of our couples, the reason they weren't getting pregnant is because there was something seriously wrong with the husband's or partner's sperm. The next level of, um, uh, of advance in the field was to try and um, work on the sperm factor issues. So many scientists around the world were doing different things to try and inject the sperm closer to the egg. When they first started to inject sperm into eggs, what they did was kill the eggs. And, but they kept trying. And so then they said, well, if we can't inject the sperm into the egg without killing it, let's just get it closer. So there were slight advances that were better than just IVF. The scientist just washes the semen off the sperm, drips it in the dish with the egg and goes home. The sperm still has to get into the egg like it does with intercourse. But the, they try to get the sperm closer and closer. And ultimately, um, the, as the, they just kept going back to the drawing board, and finally someone could figure it out, and this was, you know, a very famous group um, um, at von Sturtigan's laboratory in Belgium many years ago, jean Piero Balermo, uh, finally was able to make the instrument that you pick the sperm up to inject it into the egg small enough that he could get it into the egg without killing it. And that acronym is intracytoplasmic, into the cytoplasm of the egg, sperm injection, ICSI. And that was the next major leap in this field that revolutionized the treatment of sperm factor infertility. 
And basically, there is now no male on the planet that we can't help have his own genetic biologic child as long as he's got any sperm anywhere.